Well, hey, the CNC build is finally happening. I've only wanted it for the past eight years. Now, I'm pretty sure this is the first time my shop has been on camera. So here is a quick look for you. Um, please do pardon the mess. You know the drill. It sends four flying everywhere, and it's impossible to sweep up afterwards. Uh, sorry, awful pun. But uh, anyway, the room here is a 12 by 20 space in the basement and was formerly a bedroom, which is why we have the uh, closet doors and ceiling fan. But I pulled the carpet up and it's concrete underneath, so it makes for at least a passable shop. It's not the biggest, you know, but it's mine, so I make do. Uh, now this here is the table I'm building, which has turned out quite a bit bigger than I first planned. Uh, initially, I wanted to have a 32 by 48 inch work envelope, meaning I could put a full, or put a third of a sheet of steel on there, and maybe not be able to cut the whole thing at once, but at least have it on the machine. But the more I thought about it, the more I really wanted uh, that much of a cutting area. And that requires compensating for stuff like the dead space at each end of the axis introduced by your carriage rollers, um, and also like leeway and where you put the work and all that. So it's turned out bigger than I planned, um, but it will give me the ability to cut a full 36 by 48 inch piece of steel all in one go from end to end. And that'll be nice. Um, so yeah, it will take a lot of square footage and requires some reorganization around here, but I have plenty of you know, stuff and plan for the shop and recognition to do anyway. And at least this will provide a lot of uh, utility per square foot. Like my shop vac takes three square feet and that is just a vacuum. <laughs> so much less useful, you know, per area taken than the CNC table here. And plus, now I can store that underneath. The design here leans towards being somewhat modular. There's uh, plenty of welding involved, but there's still a few key connections I'm gonna be bolting. Uh, and the reasons for that are threefold. For one, I already have several upgrades planned for the machine. I know it's not even done yet, but already, you know, some upgrades are in store. Uh, for example, I have it mocked out over there with a belt drive on the carriage roller, and eventually there'll be a rack and pinion or possibly a ball screw. And those sorts of changes will be easier to make if I can remove uh, portions of the machine with bolts and then reattach them that way, as opposed to uh, cutting off and then redoing welds, right? Uh, secondly, is that I wanted to have at least some uh, play in the machine for adjusting and squaring it. Now, it turns out that all my welds actually ended up within about a degree of square and plumb. Uh, but quite frankly, I was not expecting to do that well. Uh, I have uh, really surprised myself here. Um, <laughs> but I guess having the bolts will at least make it that last degree out and have everything be uh, perfectly aligned. And that'll be good. Uh, and thirdly, there is a decent chance that this machine will be packed up at some point in the next few years and moved about 50 feet. Uh, I have a carport in this house that I want to eventually enclose for a garage to like double my shop space, in which case all the uh, like dirtier, like dustier, smokier, grinding equipment and that kind of stuff will go out there. So to be able to do that, I need to be able to split the table in two, preferably again, without cutting it in half and welding it back together. Now, there isn't any, uh, you know, CAD or whatever for this. The design's mostly just going with the seat of my pants. Uh, but I do have some sketches that I will uh, at least clean up and uh, put together when I do a write-up of the build. The gist of it is, we have these two long side portions here that will support the rails for the x-axis, and the y will be the gantry going across. Uh, we'll also have trusses tied together on the ends here, and several cross members underneath that will also support the water table. Now, is all the truss work here really necessary? And to be honest, probably not. But it looks hella sick, right? <laughs> and I'm no mechanical engineer. Uh, I did physics in my undergrad. So while we did discuss Young's modulus and the moment of inertia at like some point in those four years, um, it is just far, far easier for me to overbuild the shit out of this guy than it is to do the CAD and the calculations and come up with a minimum viable build. I think the max weight this guy will ever see is about 1,100 pounds, and that's uh, 55 gallons of water in the table, plus the water tray itself, plus the slat supporting the work, plus a one inch thick work piece. Uh, my machine can cut up to an inch thick, I just never plan to actually ever have to do that. So 1,100 pounds is the max this guy will see. And it should be amply, amply capable of supporting that.
The construction here is all 2x2 11 gauge and 1x1 1 1 14 gauge tubing. Uh, like I said, I'm making trusses similar to these to go across uh, these ends. I'm just waiting on building them to have the Y axis installed so I can have a finalized dimension for the width. Uh, those trusses will get bolted down with these brackets here, which have uh, 5 eighths inch holes drilled in them, oversized for half inch bolts. That way I can adjust you know, the angle on the fit. Uh, there's eight of these, uh, one for the top, one for the bottom, in every corner. Uh, now if you see how much play there is in this table in this direction, there is quite a lot. But all that's holding it together right now are a couple of clamps on these cross members down here. And that provides it with basically zero uh, resistance to shear in that direction. Meanwhile, in this direction, you can tug all day and that ain't gonna budge. Because this beam here is 10 inches wide, right? It has a six inch gap and then two and two. That is a pretty beefy beam. So I'm hoping by putting a similar one on those ends, it'll be equally rigid in that direction. Furthermore, uh, these tubes down here will eventually have tabs on them to also bolt in place. Um, again, this is waiting on having the finalized width for the Y direction. They will be what supports the water table in the end. And for that, I'm planning on an MDF box coated in fiberglass. So that'll provide the waterproofing and it will also be uh, rust proof as well. So I've heard that uh, fiberglass resin can break down under UV light, which obviously a plasma puts out plenty of but we'll see how long it actually lasts. I figure it's either uh, you go with fiberglass, which breaks down in UV, or steel, which rusts, or aluminum, which then gives you um, galvanic uh, corrosion between the steel and drop cuts and then the aluminum base itself, or you go with galvanized and get the well galvanized steel, which puts out zinc fumes I don't wanna deal with. So there's really no good option. I'm gonna try fiberglass and see how it goes. Um, now that tray will be big enough to hold, what, 55 gallons of water and be filled five inches up from the bottom. So with the MDF on top of here, that'll be putting it about this level, and then it's six inches to the top of this lip here. So a six inch deep water tray with five inches of water gives me an inch between uh, the water level and the work. I can also make deeper slats so the work will sit lower and then kind of play with, you know, what uh, position of the water in versus the workpiece to have the best combination of uh, cut cleanliness and workshop cleanliness. Now as for the amount of support that table has, I'll be having these five, uh, you know, one by one cross members here. Now if I lean all my weight on the middle of this guy, you know, my 210 pounds of shop gorilla, it does bend a little bit, but only a little bit. And that's for weight all in the middle. So with five of them, with up to, again, about a thousand pounds, that's roughly the same amount of weight, but it'll be evenly distributed by uh, the water pressing down against the water tray. And if it ends up not being enough support, it'll be very, very easy to just slide extra tubes underneath there, and then any problems will be solved. The X axes, we bolted on the standoffs on uh, either in the table, kind of like what you see here. That bolt connection will give me one last place to uh, adjust and shim the table before getting to all the CNC parts. So between the leveling feet, the brackets here, and the standoffs, I should have plenty of room to make these rails perfectly aligned. Because you can't make it perfect in the first place, at least make it adjustable, right? Now the standoffs will be welded uh, directly in the corner, and I have left enough room on the brackets there to you know, account for a two by two plus the weld bead. So that should all work out fine. Um, what we have here is a demonstration of the belt routing. It's not exactly realistic because it's, you know, clamped down on either end. Uh, ideally, you'd have the belt coming off at a bit of a, a distance from this tube. Coming in here, getting routed around the idlers and the stepper motor, which is obviously not involved yet. And then down here, coming out at the same level. Uh, that way you're getting the same amount of motion regardless of where you're on the table. With this funny angle we have right here, uh, it would actually change the amount of uh, motion you get for the revolution of the motor, depending on where you are. And if you go far enough down, you also get that rubbing on the belt. But to give you an idea, that's roughly how it works. And for the y-axis, there'll be another tube bolted down between this roller and a roller over there. And then the z will go into that. 
Now all the layout work and then the cutting, drilling, grinding, and welding takes plenty long enough without fussing with the camera. So unfortunately, I don't have a um, four times speed time lapse video, you know, with cheesy techno music in the background. <laughs> but I can give you a rundown of the steps involved in getting this far. Uh, firstly, all of my cuts are done on a dry cut saw, which is a major upgrade over an abrasive chop saw if you can afford one. Uh, I'm not sure I would endorse this one in particular, the JNC Slugger, because it is uh, one of the pricier ones out there and it had a couple of design faux pas I'm really not happy with, but I'll cover those more in another video. Um, at least I can say it does cut just damn straight dead on every time, uh, which is such an upgrade over the abrasive chop saw I used to use that I, I'm, I am very happy with that part of it. Plus, it doesn't put out tons and tons of carcinogenic dust like a chop saw, like an abrasive saw does. So that is also a big win. Uh, so using that guy, got all my cuts uh, much more plumb and square and on point, um, which just made it easier to weld everything accurately. For marking out my holes, I made a 3D printed jig. This is since broken right here, but you can kind of see how it would work. Sitting on the tube here, you can slide it back and forth, and have the spacing for your holes. I ended up using the uh, 2.5 inch rather than the 2 inch gap, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, what does matter is having a jig so you can have consistent spacing for the holes. Um, even if they're inaccurate, like 2.45 inches as opposed to 2.50, that's not the end of the world as long as they're all 2.45. <laughs> it's when you do them all by hand that like, none of them are consistent nor accurate and then your build becomes a pain in the ass. So take the time and make a jig. Even if you don't have a printer, you can still make a jig and it is worth it. For uh, drilling out the holes, I did a pilot hole first all the way through the tube and then came back and embiggened it from each side. Now when drilling that pilot through the tube, you do have some risk of the drill bit wandering as it comes to the far side. So I mitigated those risks by uh, fishing through my box of bits to find one that was reasonably uh, thick, about 3 sixteenths, um, not excessively long, with as minimal fluting as possible and as much shank as possible, making it, you know, fairly stiff. Um, also made sure it was a sharp tip, so when it came down on the bottom side, it wouldn't wander, because the inside of the tube obviously does not have a center punch the way the top side does. On top of that, when I uh, marked and punched these out, I also kept track of which side should face up and which side should face down, using the uh, side I actually center punched as the good side for the brackets on mount. Because that way, I know these two holes here are 2.5 inches apart, whereas the ones on the bottom might really be like 2.6 if the drill bit wandered as it came to the bottom side. But since the bolts are connecting to the bracket up here, the more accurate one is the one that gets the bracket. To make the brackets, I had another template. This one being a stencil I printed for directly using with the plasma. Because believe it or not, the uh, heat from a plasma cutter does not melt this stuff as long as you space it off the work. So I put some washers underneath, you can see the imprints there, and I was able to cut out eight brackets without burning this thing up. So you space it off, you clamp it down, and you can come around the outside, uh, usually in two motions, and cut out the bracket. You gotta stop once and move the clamp out of the way, but really, it's a very fast process. And then the, uh, holes on here, you can transfer and get a consistent spacing to match the holes you already put here. Because that is a crucial measurement, right? having these holes line up and also kind of having the uh, gap here for the standoffs and the weld bead. The whole straight lines and you know right angles are nice to have, but not really as crucial. Uh, it's still worth though, you know, making the jig just for that spacing and for the expediency. Because you are making again, eight of these guys. Um, now, even if you don't have the printer, you can still make a template just by printing it off on paper and then transferring it to masonite, you know, hardboard or something else with a bandsaw or a jigsaw or something like that. Um, and the nice thing about doing this in CAD is that you can do an offset to compensate for the size of your drag tip and the kerf. You'll see here that this uh, stencil, I think is what, 0.223, not quite a quarter inch smaller than the uh, bracket here, and I can already account for that when I did the cat. So that's also kind of handy. But really, I could not help think uh, about how much easier this would have been 
if I already had a CNC plasma, <laughs> right? I did the CAD, but I still have to manually cut these out because I haven't yet finished the plasma. <sighs> Chickens and eggs. For the alignment and tacking on each side, I actually did that on top of this piece of MDF because believe it or not, it's a pretty flat and dimensionally stable surface. So I laid everything out, uh, clamped it down about halfway, and then began checking the squares over and over and over again as I tapped everything home with a hammer. Then I clamped it down all the way and tacked it all in every spot with a MIG welder. Just a little, you know, blip, blip, blip all the way down. And I pulled out some sawhorses and laid them up on there to give me better access to all the, you know, full welds. And then began, you know, welding each one. Kind of jumping back and forth and flipping it over occasionally, pretending like I know what I'm doing. Uh, the uh, goal being to minimize the heat distortion that you'd get from putting too much weld in any one spot at one time. So rather than doing, you know, all from one end down, I did, you know, these trusses and those trusses and then that corner and then those trusses and then that corner and like jump back and forth, again, kind of bumbling my way through it. Uh, but in the end, it worked pretty well because each uh, side was able to stand up on its own vertically, just on the base of the two by two without the foot welded on. So I was pretty pleased by that given how top heavy these things are. Um, it just sat flat and upright, even checking it again and again with a the level there. Uh, I still did put feet on here anyway, just so I have the option to either bolt it down or shim it up or you know align it better in the future. And for that, I uh, laid out some one inch plate at the proper gap and then shimmed the hell out of it to get both plates uh, level and even. I drop the feet down and then each side. As I mentioned, these sides already kept themselves upright. So then welding the feet in place was pretty easy. So how much work is actually left on the table? Well, there's the standoff for every corner, the X axis to go into those, and the Y axis to go into them. Then there's the trusses to go from end to end, and the tabs for the bars underneath. After that, it's on to the next big task of actually CNC applying the whole thing. So let me show you the parts for that.